Good morning and a very warm welcome to the 24th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. We have apologies today from Paul O'Kane. Our first item of business for today is a decision to take agenda items 3, 4 and 5 in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Our next item is our last evidence session on the pre-budget. We are going to focus on specific budget priorities covered by our remit. I welcome to the meeting our panel, Gordon McRae, Assistant Director for the Communications and Advocacy, Shelter Scotland, Graham O'Neill, Policy Manager, Scottish Refugee Council, and Bill Scott, Senior Policy Advisor, Inclusion Scotland. So thank you very much for joining us today. And a, a few points to mention about the format of the meeting before we start is if you could just wait and, until I or a member asking the question say your name before speaking. Um, don't feel that you have to answer every single question. And if you have nothing new to add to what's been said by others, then that's perfectly OK as well. <clears throat> And can I ask everyone to keep questions and answers as concise as possible? So I am now um, going to start off with the questions, and we have approximately about an hour and ten minutes. So I'm going to kick off first. And is, <clears throat> can you describe how the cost of living crisis is affecting your organisation and the clients that you support? And in what ways do you think the impact of the cost of living crisis should influence the Scottish Government's budget decisions? And I'm going to bring in Graham first of all, and then I can pose that question to Gordon and Bill if you get any comments on that. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, convener, and to fellow colleagues in the committee. And just to say that we're, we're, we're sorry we never gave you uh, written evidence. We'll try and rectify that after the session. Uh, so, I mean, People uh, that we work with at Scottish Refugee Council, especially people who are in the, the UK asylum system, have frankly been in a cost of living crisis, uh, kind of searing uh, insecurity for about 20 years, and it's worsened. You know, as inflation's increased, for example, over the last few years. You know, asylum support doesn't match that in any. Uh, proper way. So just to give a kind of illustration for asylum uh, support levels uh, for people who are in the asylum system, uh, if you're in what's called dispersal or community-based accommodation, which is about 52,000 people across the UK currently, then you get about £6.80 a day. Uh, you're not allowed to work unless you've uh, been waiting for over 12 months, which is many people, because the asylum decisions backlog eh, for an initial decision and it's only a, a very small number of jobs in the UK government's shortage occupation list that you can access. So effectively you're denied the right to work, eh, put into the severest form of UK state sanctioned poverty and, and essentially left there, which is you know why the asylum decision backlog, which is currently I think about 170,000 and still rising, eh, is, is such a, a waste a waste of people's talents and uh, skills and desperation to contribute to their new homes, hopefully within the UK, including many other parts of Scotland at the moment, but, uh, but also a waste of financial resources. Um, so before I just mention the effects that it's having on the people we work with and serve, um, just to note that there's a gross dysfunctional distribution of public monies within the UK asylum system currently, so about never been more money in the UK asylum system that is currently so we're talking about <clears throat> four four billion pounds a year. Remember the asylum accommodation contracts were contracted out in two thousand nineteen for a ten year period at a total cost for a decade of four billion. Well that's getting eaten up in four billion a year. But the key point here is that there's a gross dysfunctional distribution of where that money's going. It's basically all going to private companies, right? It's going to Mears, Circle and Clear Springs, or the people that they contract with, increasingly hotel chains. Uh, and because of that, that gross waste of public money, none of that goes to local communities, local authorities, uh, refugees, certainly not. If you're in uh, institutional ex-hotel accommodation or barracks accommodation, you get £1.40 a day. Uh, I mean, so we're talking really grim Victorian style, deliberate destitution and suffering inflicted by the UK government on people in the asylum system. And that's worsened 
The effect is therefore like any other form of entrenched severe poverty. Health inequalities are driven uh, down to the ground uh, for people. Mental health plunges. Uh, we are seeing an increasing number of people losing their lives within the asylum system. Um, and we have been working with Liberty Investigates for a number of years exposing that, uh, that, that, that loss of life. We saw some of that in Glasgow in the early stages of the COVID period, but those warnings weren't heeded. Uh, people have recourse to you know, um, the institution which we don't want of food banks. You know, people are going to food banks routinely in order to supplement members here. You know, such as like Bob, the deputy convener, will know this well from his own work, constituency work. Um, and people, you know, sometimes don't just choose between <laughs> eating and, you know, um, Sometimes people, you know, will go without days, you know, being able to, to eat because, especially for asylum-seeking families, eh, there's about 1,500 asylum-seeking children within Glasgow currently, you know, and the parents, or parent as it often is, will, eh, will, will make those sacrifices. So there's been rampant social insecurity inflicted upon people in the asylum process for about a generation. It's got worse and it's happening in plain sight within our communities. Uh, so the effect is utterly dreadful. Uh, there are similar patterns emerging, but not as, not as desperate for, for people who have came over from Afghanistan uh, as well. They've been effectively, in our view, abandoned by the UK government. Uh, and we point to what's happened with Ukraine and, and show us what can be done if the political will and the infrastructure of government, be it UK or Scottish government, is actually put behind. Um, but we see the polar opposite, sadly, within the asylum system. So, um, I mean, at Scottish Refugee Council, we became, which is it's, it's horrendous to say, but, you know, we've, we've, we've became, it's became so normalised, you know, um, within the UK asylum system that we build our services around poverty mitigation. Uh, and we have done for for a number of years. So, I mean, there's a few other things I could say, but I'll maybe stop at this point. Um, and, I mean, the final point is maybe it's just about the Scottish Government. And, you know, the Scottish Government have been consistent backers of people in the asylum process. Uh, we do want to see more from the Scottish Government because we think that there's so much contribution that people in the asylum process can make. Um, we're in a very worrying point right now, which I would like to go into a bit later on in the, in the session, about a prospect of thousands of people being made destitute between now and Christmas within Scotland, particularly within Glasgow. Uh, and just to say that British Red Cross have flagged this up at a UK level. Uh, Glasgow is the most affected city in the UK for this imminent refugee destitution crisis. This is people who have been granted status as well. Uh, so we're, in a, we're, a, we're really at the prospect now of uh, we need to have a really serious Scottish Government-led response to that because it's coming anyway. Uh, so it's just to kind of raise that, uh, sadly, that, 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 that imminent reality. Thank you. Okay. No, thanks very much, Graeme. Um, can I now bring in Gordon? Thank you, Camina. Um, you asked what has been the impact of the cost of living crisis on uh, our beneficiaries and, and us as an organisation. And the simple answer is it's, it's devastating. The, the, the situation in Scotland just now is that a cost of living crisis exacerbated uh, a homelessness system that, w that had so many holes in it that it wasn't able to, to catch people when it, when, when it broke. We are, with the warnings of the Scottish um, the leaders of local authorities, SOLAS, um, from the Scottish Housing Regulator, we've had Audit Scotland, all, all reporting publicly on how the systemic risk of failure in, in Scottish homelessness services. That failure is live. That's happening now, especially in our larger cities. And people's lives are being, are, are not just being devastated, but they're being, they are being um, harmed quite significantly. For us, the, the cost of living crisis isn't that new to, to, to most people of, that we work with, but it's removed many of the options that, that, that we once had. Uh, an expectation that the private rented sector could pick up the pieces has just been shown to be to be short-sighted and unsustainable. The competition for 
what housing we do have is so great that, we, that there's not the ability to increase the availability of lets to homeless households. Um, and so people have been trapped in temporary accommodation. We can see the evidence for this. We now have record numbers of, of households in, in, in the homeless system and no real plan to, to address it. We've seen a 130% increase in children in temporary accommodation over the last 10 years. No, no immediate plan, no new money, no new, no, no new interventions to, to deal with it. We're seeing local authorities um, asked to do more with less. And um, I think announcements of small pockets of money that, that, that don't adequately address the, the overarching cuts. There's also a lack of transparency around where, where that money is going. I think the Audit Scotland report um, early last year really shows the difficulty of trying to understand what's happening on the ground. There are many sort of factors that drive into that. You know, undoubtedly, uh, decisions at a UK level around benefit levels, the local housing allowance, uh, tax incentives that, that actually mean that buy-to-let landlords are competing with first-time buyers, and it's first-time buyers that m miss out. So first-time buyers stay in the private rented sector. Those potential first-time buyers are then competing with low-income households for what available housing there is. Um, so th that, those are, there is a need for what we would call a whole systems approach that involves the, the UK government. But here in Scotland, within the, within the decisions that can be made with this budget, um, we think it is, is difficult to justify a year-on-year 16% cut in, in the social housing budget. Um, that was profiled in advance. And we, knew that, we knew that was coming. But it, in our view, fails to recognise what has changed since, those, since that budget plan was originally put in place. And what has changed is every six months an announcement of a new record high level of homelessness, a new record high, high level of breaches of legal duties. You know, local authorities are are acting unlawfully and are, and are announcing they're acting unlawfully because they're, un, they're unable to, to um, meet the, the statutory obligations. So for us, we would like to see a, a reprioritisation uh, when it comes to both revenue and capital. We want to see better investment in local services. We think the, the temporary accommodation task and finish group report that, that, that uh, published last year, which Shelter Scotland co-chaired along with the Association of Local Chief Housing Officers um, sets a template for what can be done in the, in the immediate term, but that takes resource. And that, currently that, that additional resource uh, isn't on the table. And ultimately we would say if the government, if Scottish ministers know what the solutions are, but choose not to, choose not to resource those solutions, then we have to, we have to, I think, reasonably conclude that they are, they are knowingly um, allowing a situation to, to get worse. Um, and we appreciate that our government has to balance decisions and has to meet other priorities. But when it comes to homelessness in Scotland, the current, the current response is insufficient to, to reduce the harm experienced by, by the people that work with Shelter Scotland. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Gordon. Um, I don't know if you want to come in, Bill. Yeah, very much so. Um, more on... Um, how it's impacting on disabled people, and particularly our own organisation. Um, we are finding it more difficult to um, meet the needs of our member organisations and our members because we are experiencing year-on-year -year cuts to our budget from Scottish Government. Um, but um, the situation faced by disabled people themselves is far more serious than that. Um, the, there is a uh, research Institute for Disabled Consumers has a research panel of 3,800 disabled people as members. All impairments are covered. It's very representative of disabled people across the UK. And they asked their um, consumer panel um, about their financial well-being. And 27% of the disabled people that were asked said they were in serious difficulties financially. And another 23% said they were struggling, and that's half of disabled people are either struggling or in serious financial difficulties. And that is echoed again by uh, GRF's finding, again, 23% of families where someone is disabled are behind on at least one bill or payment, and 4% are behind on three or more. And two-fifths of those are on 
payments to public services, DWP, local authorities. Um, and three in ten households with a disabled person have no savings whatsoever. So there is no resilience, there is no ability to meet additional expenditure. Um, and that is leading to food and fuel insecurity. And we come back to the use of food banks. I took part in a Trussell Trust event yesterday. And Trussell Trust Scotland report three out of four of all the food bank users in Scotland are disabled people and their families. So that is how it is impacting on disabled people. Remember, 20, just over 20 per cent of the population, three out of four food bank users. That, that is the seriousness of what, what it means. And we, we, coming back to the organisation, some of our staff, again, we were talking about trauma-informed practice yesterday. Some of our staff are, are traumatised by the experiences that are being related to them because disabled people are suicidal. And they're literally saying, I can't afford to put on the heating. I've got no money to put food on the table. What is the point of living? You know, and we are not an individual service provider. You know, people are not phoning us up for advice uh, on benefits or anything like that. But what they are doing is when we ask them about their experiences, they're, they're being honest with, with us. But that has an impact on staff as well. And I, I think a lot of frontline service staff are, are really beginning to feel that, that um, you know, the difficulties of dealing with people who, who have essentially given up because they, they cannot see a way out of the, the financial difficulties. And feeding their children, clothing their children, etc., is, is really, really hard. So it, it, it is a huge impact. And when we say that disabled people are suffering disproportionately, all the evidence bears it out. Okay, thanks very much, Bill. I'm now going to invite Katie Clark. And thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. And Gordon has already spoken about reprioritisation. And you'll be aware that the medium term financial strategy analysis has highlighted a funding gap for the Scottish Government. So, in light of this, how do you think the Scottish Government should respond and how should it be prioritising its budget? And I'll maybe bring in one of the other panel members who hasn't already spoken about prioritisation, Bill. <laughs> oh, or, or would one of the others prefer? I don't know. If... Yeah. Graham, would you prefer yeah, to come okay. first? Well, you know, we we would certainly urge prioritisation, reprioritisation of current spending plans. Um, I think there is a need to continue to deal with the cost of living crisis, and you know, I don't see where the spending is going to come from for that. So, you have to look at current expenditure and say, how are we going to deal with that? Second thing is that the health service because of the crisis in social care is under even more pressure and that is causing extra expenditure in the health service. So, you know, by prioritising social care spend, you actually keep people out of hospital, you release NHS resources to deal with people who are ill and, and in serious need of treatment, uh, rather than treating people because of things like hypothermia because they're not eating properly, because they've not got heating, etc. So, you know, social care and dealing with the essentials in life will relieve pressure on the NHS and release money that could be better spent elsewhere. I don't know if what, any of the other... Can I just, I mean, just to, to, to kind of build on, on the, the point about uh, reprioritisation, one thing I would say is we sometimes lose sight of the fact that affordable housing is unique as a capital a capital investment because it's an investment and it actually makes money for for government. The rents come in and pay and pay off. And there's been a, a kind of probably a generation or more view that social housing um, ha, is there to pick up the pieces for for um, the, the poorest and least you know, most, most vulnerable in society. And I, I, I think we're. We've lost sight, actually, of its foundational role within a housing system, and actually, the, the lack of social housing pushes up prices of other houses, and the interventions that government has made in the market through help to buy schemes and others have been inflationary on house prices. So, if you want to invest in housing to bring down prices, you invest in social housing. There's not, I mean, it's, 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 un, it's not that's not a controversial view amongst 
economists. Um, and so the Scottish Government look at the, the most recent uh, affordable housing supply programme statistics. I think the question is why are we still putting so much into, into alternative forms of, owner, of uh, home ownership? Why are we still putting, putting subsidy into mid-market rent, which deals with a different problem? It doesn't deal with the, the lower problem, and again can potentially be inflationary in some circumstances. So I think it's about what is the purpose of capital investment? When Audit Scotland reported on the previous affordable housing supply programme, they couldn't measure it against anything because there was no target, there was no policy goal expressed. So I think that it's getting behind the business case, not just the social, the, the, the social problems, um, which we think justifies a reprofiling of budget. Yeah, no, thank you, convener, uh, and thanks, Katie. Uh, first of all, we associate ourselves very much with the written evidence that Shelter Scotland put in. Um, there is a housing emergency. It's concerning that that housing emergency is not reflected within the Scottish Government budget. Um, and part of the reason we say that, or one of the main reasons we say it, is like colleagues at Shelter Scotland every day, our advisors who are increasingly traumatised with what they're experiencing, the scale of human need that they're dealing with. Um, are hitting this wall of inappropriate temporary accommodation that's actually not temporary, it's long-term accommodation, and that's became normalised. And we've got to this point where, as, as Gordon said, local authorities are not able to meet, and they're saying as well they're not able to meet their duties. So that, to me, and I'm not a housing specialist, you know, we work at Scottish Refugee Council and we come up in relation to housing a lot, which is why I'm talking now on it, but we're, there's, a, there's surely a moment there where we just go, OK, hang on a minute, why have we got into this situation and what do we need to do? So we think there does need to be that kind of laser focus on social housing and the capital spend is on social housing because at the moment we're seeing not only in asylum accommodation, as I said in opening remarks, this gross dysfunctional distribution of public monies and industrial scale going to the private sector and never to be seen again, never touching communities or anything like that. But we're seeing the same, we think, in relation to accommodation, temporary accommodation, so-called, for people who are born and bred in Scotland, as well as in other parts of the UK. So there's that from a social justice, this committee's a social justice perspective. We just need to stop and pause and say, hang on a minute, we need to try and get recognition of the housing emergency go back to the fundamental purpose, which I think was Gordon was saying around what 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 is it we're trying to do with housing and and, and think for the benefits and investment that it can give. Uh, and I raised the point earlier in my open remarks around what we're facing with the UK government's policy. So, as I say, we're, we're anticipating it could be about 2,500 people between now and Christmas this year that the UK government, in their own interests, are finally getting around to issuing asylum decisions after leaving people in limbo for years. Now, it's good that people are making decisions, especially for positive cases. It's long overdue, but people have been desperate for it. What should be a, a moment of celebration and hope for people is actually going to turn into a moment of acute risk, and to be honest, not just risk, reality of destitution. So when British Red Cross at a UK level talk about 50,000 people in the UK and we could have 10 cities, I mean, we, we need to be realistic. That, we're not far away from that in Scotland and particularly within Glasgow, because Glasgow is already struggling to meet its homelessness duties because of the pressures that are placed upon. We've got a lot of sympathy with the homelessness staff and the people trying to deal with that there. Um, so in terms of, we, we appreciate that the Scottish Government can automatically deal with the issues around asylum policy. Uh, we actually do think there's a legal case here about the, the way that the Home Office are acting is, in legal terms, wholly unreasonable in terms of issuing such a number of decisions with no direct funding given to local authorities affected or Scottish Government and then expecting them to pick up the pieces knowing fine well the pressures that these local authorities, especially in Glasgow, are already under. It's a kind of conscious, willful denial of the truth from the Home Office there. But the reality is all of this money is going in, well, not all, but most of it's going into private pockets. And I suppose if there's something that the Scottish Government can do there to try and be a bit harder in some 
of the private companies that are making so much money, better regulation. I think that I think to be honest, if that's within competence, that should be seriously considered. Because because otherwise we're just going to have this gross dysfunctional distribution of public monies going to private interests and all the while the families, the kids, be it asylum seeking or, or Scottish kids, they're just stuck right now in Glasgow and other areas in really inappropriate, traumatising accom temporary accommodation, which is no such thing. And how on earth can somebody move on in their lives? That, that makes a mockery of any sense of being able to get a stability in your life. So if it's refugee integration, how on earth can somebody integrate as a new refugee if they're stuck in temporary accommodation? They can. It's just this reality check that we need to say, let's grip the housing emergency. It is. It's a profound, persistent a pivotal issue and it needs to be treated as such. Thank you, Graham. I'm now going to invite Jeremy Balfour in. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, and good morning, panel. Uh, Bill, if I can maybe aim this at you first, because it picks up your submission, and then if the other two want to jump in. I mean, your submission highlights the areas for increased spend, such as social care, an additional £23 million for independent living fund, increase in the winter heating payment, and increase in social security spending. For disabled people. Given that we are in a tight fiscal framework, how should the Scottish Government fund these proposed additional spend? And I suppose, do you have a, a priority of those lists of which you would put top on list them? Um, and are there other programmes <laughs> which you would cut so that that money can be diverted there? Well, well, luckily, I'm not a Scottish Government minister. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't want to get into the business of saying where cuts should fall. Um, I do think there is a need to reprioritise. I, I, I've given the example of social care. I hate the expression bed blockers because people that are stuck in hospital because there is no social care available to them, that's the last place that they want to be. They want to be out in the community. They want to be back with their families and yet they're stuck in hospital and they're costing the NHS huge sums of money uh, to keep them there in beds that would be better used to treat people who are ill and need that treatment, but they can't get out because there, there isn't enough social care available in the community to let them out. So we need you know, to think about that in a strategic way and say, how are we going to solve that problem? And the only way I can see is we need to prioritise spend so that social care gets its fair allocation and can relieve some of the pressure on the NHS, which will help the NHS in the longer term, you know, and, and will help it even in the short term. Um, you know, the independent living fund, again, by helping people live independently on their own, you relieve pressures elsewhere in the system. So most of the, the suggestions have made, other than the social security ones, are actually about greater efficiency in terms of how we spend our money. The ones on benefits are there because the crisis for disabled people, the cost of living crisis, is bearing really, really heavily on them. They have already additional costs. You know, that's acknowledged by the government. But those additional costs have been rising with inflation. So what, and you know, scope, try and measure what those additional costs are, and they say the average is 900 a month in Scotland. 900 a month for a disabled person. So if it was 900 a year ago, it's more like 1,100 now. And where is that extra money to come from, if not from Social Security budget? Um, and I, I acknowledge that it's going to be extremely difficult, which is why I've suggested a couple of targeted pieces of spending. You know, the increase in the, the um, winter heating allowance would only cost the Scottish Government about £20 It would be really effectively well targeted to some of the poorest households. Over half of the 400,000 households that receive that payment have a disabled adult or child in them. So, you know, it's a good way of getting extra cash to people who are in desperate need. Um, you know, so, yeah, you can, you can think about targeting where, where your extra spend is going as well to make sure it is getting to the people who desperately need it. And I think that's what the First Minister said. We are going to have to make those decisions and make them in favour of those in the greatest need. I'm making the case. Disabled people are certainly amongst those in the greatest need. 
Oh, sorry, my in. Are you, I don't know if you were wanting to come in. Um, I was, I know, yeah. Right, and, I'll, and then I'll let Bob in. This is up. Where this up. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been very helpful. I mean, I suppose just on winter, winter heating payment, would you extend it to anyone on any form of adult disability payment and child payment, or is that targeting of people who are maybe at home more? Or, or do you have a view on that? I mean, I. You know, I, I, would, I would make a payment available to everybody on adult or children's you know, disability payment. Um, you could do that. Um, but um, if you're making choices um, then, uh, about those in greatest need, then those on means-tested benefits are, by definition, already in the greatest need. They're on the lowest incomes. Um, and, and therefore, it's, it's relatively well targeted to, to do it through that, through that scheme because you, you, you're absolutely certain that that money will reach at least 200,000 households with, with a disabled adult or child in. I, think I should, just for the record, convene a just remind that I am on PIP myself. OK. Thank Thanks for joining me. I'll bring in Bob Doris. Thank you. Just really briefly to, to Mr Scott, I know it's hard to choose what to prioritise and what to deprioritise. The £20 million suggestion that you made, Mr Scott, uh, there's also a suggestion that the Scottish... Uh, the child Scottish child payment should should also increase from twenty five pounds per week. And I would note that forty per cent of children living in poverty have a disabled person within that household. So the Scottish Child Payment disproportionately supports disabled families yep. also. And that, that gets lost a little bit sometimes. So if you had a choice, Mr Scott, would you increase the winter heating allowance or would you increase the Scottish child payment? Because those are the kind of invidious choices that government have to make. What's your view on that? I'd increase both. <laughs> Um, because and taking the money from here. Because because one is aimed at dealing with fuel poverty during the winter, and and we have to get our heads around the fact that last winter, 800 people were hospitalised for hypothermia in the space of three weeks in Scotland. If we want to prevent that. We want to prevent that winter pressure. Sorry, Mr. Scott, you've chest. made your case. You, 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 you've, the point I'm trying to make, convener, is you've absolutely made your case. £20 million for wind heating allowance, £40 million would be fantastic. So would £60 million. Yeah. That's not the point I'm making. You've absolutely made your case, Mr. Scott. But you're talking about priorities, yeah. and I'm asking you to be laser like in what your priorities would be, because that's what we have to decide as a committee as well. Yeah. In, within priorities, what you have to do is say who are in the greatest need. OK, there is additional help there for all families on low-income benefits through the Scottish Child Payment. That's absolutely right that all of those families need that support. What I'm saying is disabled households face additional costs over and above those faced by every other family. And therefore, you also need to provide them with some additional support. And that is acknowledged within the social security system in disability premiums, carers, benefits, etc. So it's, it's not an either or for me. It, it is, yeah. yes, we need to support all of the families, but we also need to give targeted support to those families. I won't come back in, can, I, come back in yeah. but I appreciate what I have to ask that yeah. question when we're doing budget yeah. scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much, Bill. Um, I'm going to quickly bring in Gordon, but I am just conscious of time, and then I'll, I'll bring in Rose McCall. Just very quickly, I think I'm going to totally understand the point that was making. I think they're just, as a third sector organisation trying to scrutinise the budget, there is not enough information in the budget to actually, when you talk about £20 million pounds or £40 million, pounds, it's impossible for policy um, people outside of, of the civil service to actually understand that level of allocation within, within this budget. And so, whilst the, the overarching point is well made, I, I think it is it's, it's quite un, un, unreasonable for a third sector organisation to try and offer well, that one versus that one when, when we don't have that level of scrutiny. Thank you. I am now going to bring in Rose McCall. Thank you. Uh, thank you and thank you panel for, for coming along. Um, you have kind of answered this already. It was actually to Gordon, um, but given the information you have already given and Graham, I think you have already uh, answered this. Um, why should uh, affordable housing supply be the Scottish Government's number one priority for capital spend in the budget? Now, as I say, you have already pretty much given me an answer for that, but uh, again, if you could just add a little bit to it, that, that would be helpful. And I suppose I am asking really, um, do you think that there actually is adequate home, um, homeless um, focus when it comes to the Parliament or, or even this committee, considering its, its links to child poverty and, um, as, as Graham's already very eloquently put, to the refugee issue that we, we have? 
I think it's important just to, to reiterate that this is a housing emergency. This is not normal. And I think the, you, know, you ask, is there enough focus on that? I, 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 I don't see evidence that there is a huge amount of energy from Parliament or Government to develop an, emergen uh, an emergency intervention at a time when, when we have um, record levels of homelessness, record levels of stay. You know, and I think that there's a real risk that we become like a boil in a frog situation, just becomes normalised, that this is just the new normal, this level of homelessness. On the issue of, of, of supply, I've already said why I think it should be reprioritised, but I, I would add to that, it isn't just about money, it's also about how that money is spent. And I think there is quite a lot of evidence from, this, from the Scottish Housing Regulator and from social landlords themselves that that we expect what's called the housing revenue accounts to do an awful lot when it comes to borrowing for net zero, borrowing for, for the decarbonisation. And I think there is, you know, as I say, this is an emergency. We need to say we can't do every priority at the same time, and it's very much you know, the same as Deputy Convener was saying. So what is the order of priority? We would say it's new supply. So let's make sure that the, the capital investment we have goes on new supply, and we might have to take a view as to it, the social, some social stock may take a bit longer. The other thing we, sh we, we, may, we, we think we should be doing is buying stock on the open market more readily. There is some good evidence now. Edinburgh done a little bit more of that recently. But when we're talking about targeting the likes of larger properties for larger families, which are often um, more in need for minoritised ethnic groups or, or households with disabled people, um, Increasingly, one of the quickest ways to do that and reduce pressure on the system is to buy in, in, in the open market. So that's the kind of leadership role, as well as having the capacity that's, that, that's required. Um, yes, Graham, I'm happy to, to hear what you want to say. Yeah, I mean, I think Gordon kind of saying that about the order of priority is quite important. So we, we do think, when we've reflected on this internally, because we're, we're seeing a lot of the issues that shelters see um, of people who are not having their homelessness uh, rights met and and then when they are ultimately met it's, it's into really inappropriate accommodation as I was saying and the scale of that we were seeing for a number of years uh, but it really up we, I suppose even though we think overall the Ukraine response from the Scottish government has been has been positive it did also expose in a, a the, the fragility of the wider homelessness issues. We've been seeing an asylum for a while, um, and also I've mentioned a few times what what's about what we're about to encounter an asylum in the next three months within particularly Glasgow, but also in wider Scotland. And I, I suppose just come back to first principles, you know, of like I'm not a housing specialist, but is if you if if you have a home or something you feel is a home as opposed to B&B, then you start to be able to settle mentally and you start to be able to plan. You start to be able to hopefully get a job. You start to be able to, if you've got family, get your kids into school um, or nursery. And you can actually start to do what I suppose many of us in this room at this point in our lives at least can take for granted. You know, And for us, you know, working at Scottish Refugee Council, we've worked, like many people who are in homeless situations, who have had chaos riven through their lives, disruption riven through their lives, and are, and are having to be resilient and sometimes can't be. You know, It just becomes unbearable. And the importance when people speak to us about having that home is, is profound. Mm -hmm. And... Going from lived experience, therefore, I'm trying to convey that, obviously, as a representative from the Scottish Refugee Council, is people are telling us this is essential as well. So if we want to take people seriously, we do need to, to go, OK, what does that actually mean? We need to do as people all in relative positions of kind of power, essentially, government, parliament, NGOs, etc. And at the moment, we're not seeing that translated into the Scottish Government's priorities. Now, we very much appreciate what the Deputy Convener is saying, that you know, hard choices do need to be made. We get that. But the way we try to frame this is to say, from a refugee integration perspective, that people have got no prospect of being integrated or integrating themselves, if that's what they wish to do, uh, if they don't have a home. Uh, and they really need a home to, to put those things in lives. But we, we're working with families in temporary accommodation in, in different parts of Scotland, particularly in Glasgow, they now. And that's a very distant prospect, a home for them. So, I mean, I'm not going to get into technicalities beyond just trying to kind of convey here, hopefully, that it's a pivotal step because it's essential for being able to move on and settle and go on with your life. A Scottish child payments are such an important intervention 
but that is that's in terms of order of priority it's part of it it needs to be part of it but i do think that we need to think how do we bring the housing emergency in so that the people which get the scottish child payment are actually able to use that resource to move on in their lives so for, in terms of like just the thinking around this like re, you know refugee integration policy for years in our view has been very positive and progressive in scotland but new scots is a strategy which is currently out for consultation hasn't had teeth it hasn't actually been something that permeates policy within the Scottish Government, be it child poverty or transport policy or whatever, or housing policy. It's just not there, right? Frankly, it's not there. And that's one of the things we're talking to the Scottish Government now. We need it to be there. We need it to be mainstreamed. We need it to be there for it. And if, if for example, it was there, then you could start talking about things like a refugee integration service for Scotland. And right. that is an investment, because what you can do then is have a bridge from people who are desperate to work yeah. getting their Thank status you. and then moving on to work and then being able to access housing rather than homelessness yeah. uh, as well. So there's, I think this thing about investment and prevention is really important and the housing emergency needs to be acknowledged. Otherwise, we're, we're not actually going to deal with... Uh, we're just going to be sticking plasters on the fundamental problems. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. It actually sort of leads a little bit on, on to my next question, if that's OK, Convener. And I thank you very much for the information y you've given. And back to Gordon, if, if I may. The Scottish Housing Regulators National Report on the Scottish Social Housing Charter 22-23, that's a fun thing to say, highlighted the tough uh, financial decisions social landlords need to make arising the... Um, from the settle, settling below inflation rent rises, along with increased cost of main, maintenance and improving, I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a cold, my brain's a bit fuzzy, just bear with me, um, and improving the energy efficiency of existing stock. Registered social landlords are reducing and delaying their plans to build new homes. Um, I've actually had representations from social landlords that say that um, the, the rent freeze legislation has directly uh, reduced, delayed and in some cases completely halted plans for new social accommodation. So given that there are challenges that social landlords face, how much difference would an increased capital budget make for new homes? And is there any other action that you think the Scottish Government could take to um, to improve the supply of new homes. And uh, Gordon, primarily, I agree, I know you want to come in, but I, I really want to hear what Gordon's got to say on this. Um, I think it's important we disaggregate what actually social landlords are doing. So, you know, I'm surprised to hear that a social landlords said that they're postponing social housing mm -hmm. um, because, of, because of the rent cap and rent freeze. Um, but I'm aware that they've, they've postponed mid-market rent Developments that, that they, they believe will finance, you know, the profits of which can go back into the, into the system, and there's definitely there definitely is a, an impact on, on on that as far as rent caps. Shelter Scotland, we never actually call for um, a rent cap when we welcome anything that reduces the the, the housing costs of, of households, which we, we we think are too high. But we are very conscious of the impact it has on housing revenue accounts, especially if that if that policy is not planned and it's not something that we're able to. To, to, to propose. We also haven't really seen a benefit to our clients of the eviction ban because of the way that the, the arrears threshold was set so low. So within, within that, we have, we have a housing, housing providers who, whose own financial resilience is now, is now severely challenged. I think we are concerned that some social landlords, understandably, are postponing uh, development work because there's not a duty to build. There's no requirement in social landlords to grow their housing stock. Their requirements are to maintain uh, and meet the needs of their existing, of their existing tenants. And, and it, is, it is pragmatic for a, for a, for a board uh, looking at the financial, the financial situation to say, well, let's not take on anything that's a new risk. Let's focus it. And that's why we say it's for the Scottish Government to provide that, that leadership in that direction to set a mission of making sure that we're building social homes, uh, that we're targeting those social homes where they're most needed, that they take the form of, of larger properties that address the, the, the emergency in, in temporary accommodation, and that we listen to the voices in the, uh, in the housing sector, both the regulator and the, and the landlords, to say, what do you want us to do first? Because we can't do everything at the, at the same time. And I would certainly share Graham's observations around the Ukrainian resettlement you know, a, a, a very productive, positive approach that was taken. But there wasn't the capacity within the homelessness system 
to, to both absorb that new, new, new response and deal with what was, already, what was already a crisis. And I think sometimes we, you know, we need to be cautious about layering more and more expectation on what is a diminishing capacity within, within service providers uh, across the country. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm quickly going to bring in James Dornan, who is um, attending remotely um, with a supplementary. So I invite James uh, to come in. Th thank you very much, convener. Um, it's just on the, the point Gordon made there. Is he saying that, that landlords should be putting back what he considers to be unnecessary improvements or repairs and everything should be going on in new build? Because there is always a certain amount of money and I mean I know that we need more housing. I agree that social housing should be a priority, but sometimes it's it's cheaper for the government to be able to, to be able to build to get the private housing built than it is local authority housing or social housing. But is he really saying that what should be happening here is there should be no work getting done on improving the the energy and housing or or uh, it should be doing both with a pot of money that is not infinitesimal? No, that's not what I said. I said we shouldn't be relying on housing revenue account to, to finance it and fin to, to finance more and more things. Housing revenue accounts should be used to finance the improvement of existing stock and new stock. What we've seen is uh, an increase in the expectation that that will also meet the decarbonisation agenda and, 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 and other things. So, it's that there has been an increase in expectation of what that source of income will, will, will address, um, but there hasn't been an increase in, that, in, in that, that income for social landlords. Okay. okay. Thanks, James. Can I just quickly come in as well on a supplementary, Gordon, in relation to what, what, what you've touched upon as well, and that is like the £60 million um, national acquisition plan that was announced um, just at the beginning of the summer. Hmm. And I know from my own local authority in South Lanarkshire, they have been um, purchasing through finance um, quite a lot of private um, you know, houses and, and whatnot within the area, particularly in East Kilbride in my constituency. But have you got any um, best practice in terms of other local authorities in, in terms of doing that? And is that a pattern that's actually starting to emerge to, to, to basically, you know, deal with homelessness? Yeah. So this was this was very much this is the government's response to the task and finish group. Um, the sixty million is not new money. It's the it's focusing existing existing allocation on acquisition. We very much welcome that. I think it's important to say what the difference within this national acquisition programme is supposed to be, because, as you rightly say, local authorities and RSLs have been acquiring property for a long time, and it's always been part of the of the mix. But generally, it's been last in a last in a block, so that it makes the business case for for maybe insulating a, a, a series of tenements. So, it's, you know, a landlord has had a policy of buying that what that last property if it comes onto the market, or it's been to meet. You know, it's been when uh, a developer in an area has has brought a, brought a, a development on, and they've had they've had properties that, that they've been looking to, to offload. What we're looking for with the national acquisition plan is to target purchases where they're needed for the, especially these larger households that are trapped in temporary accommodation for years on end. And it's 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 saying how can we use acquisition to reduce the number of people in temporary accommodation, as opposed to using that acquisition as part of the normal mainstream um, you know, supply of, of, of new affordable housing. This is a, a kind of short-term thing. The guidance is not yet published. There is ongoing work between, between local authorities, the Scottish Government. Um, we're not quite sh we, we hope that's not just a sort of checklist that is actually kind of quite, quite targeted. We're not party to, to those conversations uh, and we await with interest what, what, what will come forward. There is some good practice. We were aware of, of um, Edinburgh in recent times, recent times starting to, to look more, more proactively, uh, especially this issue of larger properties that, that, that keeps coming up. And there's an, there is some work behind the scenes for local authorities and other social landlords coming together to co-produce that guidance that, that, that will come forward. So, Whilst we are concerned that there is no new money um, and we want to see explicit reference to properties for people in the, in the temporary accommodation system, um, we do welcome the, the, the use of, of acquisition as, a, as, as part of the toolkit to meet, to meet existing need. Okay. Thank you very much. I am now going to invite Bob Doris. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks, Commissioner. Um, this is a, a question for Graham O'Neill. Um, Graham, I, I was going to ask you what elements of the budget you think are most important for supporting refugees and asylum seekers, and clearly you've put on record very powerfully issues in relation to housing. So, yeah. if I could ask you to restrain yourself and not go down that road, because that bit we know and we're, yeah. we're clear about that. What other aspects of budgets do you think makes an impact? Uh, because you'd like to see more spent on, despite my appeal for the money coming from, I get all that. But in answering that question, because of time constraints, I may not get back in, convener, I'm conscious that the Legal Immigration Act constrains spend on monies in this area, because it ends Scottish Government powers to support survivors of trafficking in Scotland. For instance, when I look at the budget of for three years between 2022 to 2025, mm -hmm. Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance Tara and Migrant Help are scheduled to £6.35 million pounds between them. Uh -huh. That might be ultra virus for the Scottish Government to fund going forward because of the Legal Immigration Act. And it would be remiss of me as Deputy Chair of the Cross-Party Group on Migration not, not to mention that during yeah. budget scrutiny. So what areas of spend has significant impact? Where would you like to see more? And do you have any comments on those restrictions on government? Okay, thanks very much, Deputy Convener. Um, so I'll keep out of the housing <laughs> issue. Um, I mean, of course, the Scot I mean, people in the asylum process, as well as people that have just been granted status, you know, they're, they're coming out of really severe poverty, as I, as I said early, earlier on. So, you know, this, things like the Scottish Child Payment are, are, are so important, as they are for all, all children and families. Um, so, you know, we welcome that. Who wouldn't welcome that from a social justice perspective? Um, the... The, the, the parts of the Scottish budget which really help the third sector work, you know, the third sector budget line, you know, the support that's given to, to organisations that work in this area is, is, is vital. Uh, I suppose on that, we would say that we need to think more, uh, more productively, I think, around what we mean by things like integration standards and integration services. Uh, and... I think often we felt that they'd been kind of like mired to an extent in quite a short-term intervention for people as they move from one system to another system, so from the UK system to the to the to the Scottish system, in our case in the UK, and uh, and really not thinking uh, enough about work and how we can get people through an integration service into work. Uh, Social security, housing, really important, but works are really... And I think we need to be looking, because the Home Office are, you know, at long last, issuing a lot of decisions at breakneck speed. Many of those decisions around three quarters will be grants of refugee status. We have huge labour market challenges across the UK as well as in other Western European countries. So, you know, we need to be thinking a bit more broadly, I think, about how we can invest through Scottish Government funding and integration and work being absolutely pivotal to that, because that's what people tell us is really important. So that's not necessarily something that uh, would automatically mean more money getting spent, but I think there needs to be more requirements put, uh, more joined up working between local authorities, refugee sector and employers to make that happen on a national scale, because refugees are across Scotland now. It isn't only Glasgow, and it's not going to only be Glasgow either. So I think that would be an important... It was, you know, we need to have national refugee integration services and standards. The Scottish Government um, are committed to this. We know they are, but the, as a result of Brexit, EU withdrawal, there was asylum migration integration funds given, about 50 I think it's about £15 million pounds over the last five years, uh, which the Scottish Government used to fund various integration projects through New Scots, which is welcome. Uh, that funding's away now. That, that funding doesn't exist from January. Uh, so there's a, there's a big gap sitting there. But the gap isn't a drain. The gap can be filled in an investment preventative way. That is, and that's why I say National Refugee Integration Service and standards with work as the key thing, because that being the genuine way people can start to, sorry, <laughs> can start to get into uh, the services that, and, the, and, and rebuild their lives, which is what refugees want to do more than anything else, and shed the refugee label. So, I mean, I'm aware of time, so maybe I'll just go with the trafficking issue, if that's helpful now. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, the Illegal Migration Act is, is one of the most obscene 
pieces of legislation that we've had at a grim predecessor, the Nationality and Borders Act. And I, mean, I say obscene because the Illegal Migration Act ends the right to have an asylum claim considered in the UK. So it severs the UK state from the Refugee Convention, which came out from the horrors of the Holocaust. It saved millions of people's lives. So it's a big deal what's happened there, and it's a horrible thing that the UK government uh, and the current Home Secretary uh, have, have done. So it also, equally egregiously, it, it, it seeks to end access for trafficking survivors to support, including support that is enshrined in Section 9 and Section 10 of the Human Trafficking Exploitation Scotland Act here. Um, we do not think, and we have we've, we've furnished the Scottish Government with Kay Springham Casey's legal opinion, we do not think this is a done deal. Uh, we do think that the European Convention on Human Rights, well, we do not think, we know the European Convention on Human Rights through its Article 4, which is to remind everybody, is one against slavery, it is an absolute prohibition, it is not a qualified prohibition within the ECHR. It has three clear positive anti trafficking duties that flow out of it. One is to have an illegal administrative framework in place, well, we did, till the Illegal Migration Act tried to eviscerate that framework, uh, you know, through the through its uh, attempt to end access to traffic and support rights and non-expulsion protections. Um, the second is to protect people who are identified as trafficking survivors. So if a charity or Police Scotland or somebody identifies somebody as a presumed trafficking survivor, they would at the moment put that person into a problematic, delay-ridden Home Office national referral mechanism, the identification system. But in so doing, that person as soon as the duty to remove arrangements within the Illegal Migration Act are commenced, we expect that to be after the Rwanda judgment is, is announced in January, then, then that person will be greeted by the Home Office official. And that Home Office official, and this isn't well understood, I know it's understood by you guys, but not well understood generally, is that Home Office official doesn't have any discretion to do otherwise than to say, you, trafficking survivor, the police squad have just referred to, you're a removable person, you're punted into our detention regime, and we'll look to remove you, including to Rwanda. That's just the reality. I'm not exaggerating. That's the reality. That's what the Illegal Migration Act duty to remove arrangements require Home Office staff to do. So obviously we are saying to Scottish Government, we've been saying it for a long time, especially with the Legal Migration Act, cut off your contact with the Home Office National Referral Mechanism and you establish your own identification system for this crime of human rights violation of human trafficking. That's one thing that we continue to think is essential. Uh, but the issue around access to support rights, well, the second positive duty is access to support rights. So the Scottish Government, we would say, please keep that support in place we're not convinced it is ultra-virus, and the reason we're not convinced is how would the Scottish Government be able to defend itself in court, which could happen in, an, in a perverse way, because the invidious position had been put in by the Legal Migration Act, how would they defend themselves in court from a trafficking survivor that says, look, I'm a trafficking survivor, I, I can see Section 9 of the Human Trafficking Act, I want to have access to that, which is a lot of rights, really good ones, counselling, accommodation, legal support, etc. And if the Scottish Government to say no, we can't, because we've been required, which would be the only defence available, if we were to say but we can't do that because the Illegal Migration Act requires us, us not to as primary legislation, then you've got Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a fundamental law. It's, not, it's, it's, it's co-equivalent to the sovereignty of the UK Parliament. It's just sitting there watching this ding-dong between the Illegal Migration Act at the UK level and the Scottish Government saying we want to maintain access, but we can't maintain access to traffic and support rights. So the reality then is that we think and we hope that there certainly will be a legal challenge at the UK level to the attempted ending of traffic and support rights within the Illegal Migration Act for all trafficking survivors, including in Scotland. But we would want the Scottish Government, if there was that legal challenge, to intervene in it, because otherwise they are going to be in this invidious, and potentially they might end up having to be a respondent, which would be really perverse. And why this all matters, aside from trying to help somebody, is, in our view, the Illegal Migration Act is a boon to organised crime. Right? It's, got, it's basically saying, see all these people that have come in, through irregular means necessarily, because there's no asylum visa to get in, or been brought in through trafficking survivors, we're no interested in them. And it's basically pushing people to organised crime exploitation. And if you've got organised crime exploitation, I've been saying this to committees for such a long time, then what you have is communities that are less safe. So we need in Scotland to 
be really clear and brave about what we can do legally in this. And part of that we would want to see is continue to support traffic and support rights. That may be through other mechanisms. It could be that we, we need to think about our vulnerable persons legislation in relation to local authorities so that we can provide those rights. I'm only cutting Sorry. you off because the convener, I, I know, needs to move on. Uh, but and maintain the budget lines that currently exist and use that money clearly to continue to help that, that group, irrespective of the Illegal Immigration Act. I suppose that's what I'm trying to elicit from. Yeah, we, we want the Scottish Government to do that, and we okay. want to do it because we think there's clear ECHR legal reasons that actually would support them to do it. They've got an arguable case, but also we think that it's a prevention mechanism because it's a traffic and support system that tries to get people, protect people from the system of exploitation that's awaiting them if it's not there. Eh, that helps the communities. And the final thing, sorry, just to add, is that the Scottish Guardianship Service eh, is under huge pressure. That's the Independent Advocacy Service for Unaccompanied Refugee Children. Massive increase in the last few years, particularly since it became a statutory service on the 1st of April. Huge child protection issues that have been raised by that. We, are not, we don't have the resources at the moment in the Scottish Guardianship Service to meet the need that we, we want. Again, we think about that, what it is, which is an investment as a protection factor to stop the most vulnerable people, in this case unaccompanied refugee and trafficked children, from falling into the hands of organised crime exploitation. So this thing about, I'm trying to give two clear examples, maintain traffic and support, maintain the Scottish Guardianship Service adequately we need. These are investments as protection factors so people don't fall into the clutches of organised okay, crime. Because otherwise that's what well legislation yeah. will do. Thanks, Graham. Um, you know, really interesting stuff there, but I, I do Sorry. am conscious of time and we do need to move on. So I'm going to bring in James Dornan. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. Uh, this is for Bill. Um, Bill, your submission states that more needs to be done to ensure that funded childcare that is available is both accessible to and inclusive of disabled children and parents. Can you give us a, a sort of clear indication of what you think needs to be done and how the Scottish Government can address this in its budget? I think it's, it's essential that um, when local authorities are commissioning uh, local childcare arrangements that they need to ensure that the childcare that's available is available to disabled children and to disabled parents. So, you know, some of the childcare, it's not about physical accessibility often. It, it, it's often about having the resources that you need to deal with children who are autistic or you have behavioural issues, learning difficulties, etc., to make sure that they're in a safe environment. Because if, if it's not, um, then the parents can't place their children there and therefore they're being denied the childcare that should be available to them is just the same as every other uh, parent with children in that age group. So there are definitely issues there. Um, they're even more acute in remote, remoter areas of Scotland. Um, where the, you know, the availability of paid childcare is, is difficult anyway, um, but making sure that it's accessible to all the children in the area is, is, is a big issue. So, yeah, it's, it's essentially just making sure that the public spend is ensuring that all children and all parents can, can benefit from it um, and that disabled children and disabled parents aren't um, excluded from the free provision that's otherwise available. So in terms of the budget and, and the Scottish Government's role in that, how do you see the, the, the budget being able to facilitate what it is that you're, you're asking for? It, it, it's more that um, when you know, spending de decisions are being made at Scottish Government through a local authority level, that the needs of disabled children and disabled parents are being taken into account and ensuring that before you commission a contract with a provider, you, you are making sure that, that they can take all the children that might you know, need to come through their doors and that can accommodate the needs of the parents that are bringing those children. Uh, through their doors. So it, it's not about additional spending as, as such, it's just making sure that you're getting appropriate childcare for, for all the children that need it. Yeah. Thank so you. it's more about the arrangement that's made between yeah. the providers and the yeah. local authorities. And, 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 you know, and, and, and Scottish Government could, could be asking local authorities what do they do 
you know, to make sure that, that accommodation, uh, childcare accommodation is, is suitable for all the children that might need it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Bill. Thanks very much. Um, I believe Jeremy Balfour wants to come in with a supplement. Yeah, just Thanks. a very quick supplement. I mean, presumably here in Edinburgh we've had an issue recently with um, after-school care, so breakfast care and after-school for disabled people not having the appropriate support. So presumably this is not just for the under-fives, yeah. but we have to look at the appropriate support for disabled children who are going to mainstream school, but the parents require the appropriate support, and presumably that needs to be financed properly as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're talking about huge amounts of additional spend, but you know, um, it, it, it really is an issue. You know, I think Scottish Government are right to be trying to improve after-school provision because, again, the difficulties, particularly at lone parents, but all parents face in juggling childcare and working, and and you know, having to get the kid to the you know, to school and then having to pick them up from the childcare facility if, if again it's not accessible to the parent or not accessible to the child then they, they're, they're having to make sure their hours are reduced to, to fit in round the childcare that is available to them so yeah I think, I think we, we do need to see that I know it's not exactly always a budget issue but it, it's certainly something the Scottish Government could be saying to local authorities you know when, when you're planning to expand after-school childcare, it has to be accessible to disabled parents and disabled children. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm now going to invite Marie McNair. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. I'll direct my questions to, to Bill Scott, if that's OK. Um, what are your views on how the, the, the social security budget is uh, funded? There's obviously an increased uh, take-up of benefits uh, that have transferred over uh, to the Scottish Government. How welcome is this? And do you feel that there's a future pressure on the, the Scottish budget going forward? Well, I know just myself that know that, that there is pressure on the Scottish budget going forward. The increased spending you know, that the Scottish Government has already committed to is very, very welcome. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, I've said it before, the, 20, you know, the Scottish Child Payment has been a lifeline to, to many, many families that have allowed them to, to continue to feed and clothe and eat uh, their, their children so that you know, they, they've, they've been able to have you know, a reasonable time um, saved them from entering into the deepest poverty um, that, they, that they might have experienced otherwise. And that is, is additional spending. Um, there will be increased take up the other um, benefits, I hope, in the longer term, the disability benefits as well, because if we've got a fairer system, then probably more people will access it and, and receive those benefits. And it, essentially, we have to plan for that. And, you know, I pointed out, I think, to the very end of the, the written submission we made, that probably the Scottish Government is going to have to raise additional revenue to meet those spending commi commitments in the future. Um, it's got, a, you know, it's got a de facing a deficit at the moment. That deficit will grow um, as Social Security spend grows. But going back to seeing housing as an investment, I see it as such, you know, um, disabled people disproportionately live in social housing because they can't afford uh, their own homes in many cases. So, you know, um, it, for them, you know, again, coming back to it needs to be both affordable and accessible. And, and the less there is in the supply chain, um, then it means that often disabled people are stuck in inappropriate housing as well. But it's the same with Social Security. If we want to have a modern decent society where everybody can take part equally. We need to recognise that some people are unfairly excluded from the labour market um, because of discrimination, um, because of the, some of the barriers they face, and therefore we need, we need to make sure that they're properly looked after if they're ill or if they're disabled to the, to the extent that they can't participate as fully as they might want to in the labour market. So, Social Security spending is, is absolutely necessary, and we will have to look at the adequacy of disability benefits going forward as well. Yep. Uh, the Scottish uh, Government, as you said, obviously expanded eligibility for some benefits, you know, um, adult disability payment and Scottish carers 
assistance without requisite funding from the UK government? Uh, does, does this not put continued uh, pressure on the Scottish government funding this additional expenditure? You obviously touched on it a bit. Can you expand yeah. a wee bit, Bill? Yeah, that, it, it's, it's exactly the case. You know, if if you um, slacken the eligibility criteria, even a small amount then you will incur additional spending, and, and that is not going to be covered by the UK Government, who, who are essentially giving us a per capita allocation of the UK spend. And we have always, in Scotland, by the way, had more disabled people, not always, but we've, we've had it for some time, more disabled people than most other areas of the UK. I think the, the other areas of the North East of England and, and uh, South Wales are, are on a par or slightly higher than, than Scotland. But it's partially a legacy of you know, our heavy industries. Mm -hmm. It's also a legacy of some factors such as MS being more prevalent in, in, in Scotland because partially related to lack of sunlight and things like that. But because of that, we, we've always had a larger uh, spend on disability payments. And we just need to acknowledge that, that we, we have got a, uh, you know, a, a community where more people are likely to be disabled people and therefore there's always going to be slightly more spending on, on disability benefits. But the adequacy has also been impacted in, in recent years because of inflation, because of the other factors. Yes, you know, they, they tend to rise in line with the UK um, you know, allocations, but if, if there are less people eligible down south, if there are changes mm -hmm. to the disability benefit system down south, that impacts in Scotland. There are currently changes being mooted to the work capability assessment um, regime that exists um, that will mm -hmm. um, indirectly impact on ADP in Scotland, I would say, because they're changing some of um, the scores or, or mm -hmm. proposing that they change some of the scores or get rid of some of the descriptors from the work capability assessment. And they say that they will then probably replicate that awesome. with the PIP assessment. Mm -hmm. If it is replicated in the PIP assessment, then far fewer people will be eligible for PIP overall. And that means if we still retain the same eligibility criteria in Scotland, the disparity between, between here and the rest of the UK is going to grow. Um, so you know, I'm flagging that up because I think this is part of the, you know, the devolution settlement said those benefits were coming to Scotland and we could more or less do with them as we pleased. But if there are changes to you know, PIP down south that Im impact indirectly, then we're, we're going to have a devolution settlement that isn't real because, because the budget is not going to be coming to Scotland that will allow us to support disabled people to the extent that this parliament has decided they should be, be supported. Thanks for that, Bill. Thanks very much. I'm now going to invite Ros McCall back in. Thanks. Yeah, back to me and, and back to you, Gordon. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to read this one. Um, wh why are you concerned? I think you've actually alluded to this the need for more resources, but wh why are you concerned that the Scottish Government's response to the temporary accommodation task and finish uh, group will not drive the structural change needed to tackle the housing emergency? And how can the forthcoming budget decisions help to drive this structural change? Thank you. Um, so for us, when we talk about there being a housing emergency, it, it, we say that because it's not just one crisis. It's an affordability crisis. It's, a, it's an accessibility crisis. It's a, it's a crisis for children. Uh, it's a crisis of course. So there's, there's all of these crises come together as, uh, as an emergency. And, and the Scottish Government have, and, and we should be very clear, we agree with the Scottish Government's written vision and written policies. The Housing to 2040 sets a, a, a clear vision. Um, the house building target of 110,000 by, by uh, in 10 years. We're disappointed that there's no target for this parliament. Um, that was removed. It was in the Housing to 2040 document, but it wasn't in the Butte House agreement. So, and, and, and from the, in the Chamber of Ministers have been clear there is no, there is no numerical target in this parliament. Um, and, and, and I say that because that's where our concern arises. So on paper, we have a vision that's positive. It's about rights, it's about supply, it's about inclusion and, and, and accessibility. 
But when, turned into, when, when that's turned into action, when it's turned into, into budget decisions, when it's turned into policy decisions, we're just not seeing the, the cut through. So when we say that we're concerned that the, the response to task and finish group isn't going to drive structural change, it's not driving structural change because we don't know how many homes are going to be built this year. We don't know how, whether that's linked to, to an, a, a, an assessment of need. We don't know whether the purpose of that is to, is it to reduce temporary accommodation, is it to meet the housing needs of the country, because those are, those are, depending on what destination you set, you have, you have different policy choices in terms of what, what you do. Um, there are important mitigations that the Scottish Government do and should continue to do in the budget, be it the so-called bedroom tax or work in the, work in the, um, the social welfare fund and, and other things that, 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 that are important uh, in terms of meeting the problem right now, if you get you know, a harm reduction model, if you like, but the structural change that will, that will reduce poverty, will tackle child poverty in this country, is about building more social homes. And at this point in time, we simply don't know what the Scottish Government expect to get for the £3.5 billion pounds that they've put, they've put in the budget. If we did know that, if there was a clear express vision, then we have more confidence being able to say that they're going to, ta they're going to address the structural problems. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just conscious that we're kind of running over time, um, but if, if uh, just to remind everyone to be as, as concise as possible. So, and on that, um, I'm going to ask. Um, I think I'm going to ask Graham on this one. Are you concerned about unequal impact of the Scottish Government uh, policies and budget decisions on protected group, particularly on um, those from like ethnic minorities? And if so. How can we actually? They, they, well, how can the situation be improved? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, one of the reasons we associated ourselves with, with Shelter Scotland's uh, written evidence is, you know, that there is uh, particular ethnic minority groups who have particular housing needs in terms of, uh, you know, numbers and, and such like. So we think that needs to translate itself into, you know, uh, the capital spend on social housing, uh, so that. That, you know what we can what we can do is is provide homes that can be homes for people. Going back to what I was saying, you know, a wee while ago around as a home is a basis for people then to build a new life, which is the second part of what being a refugee is. The first is get out of the situation, and um, and the second is which is often not remembered is just to rebuild your life somewhere um, because it's not safe to return to where where where, where you've come from. So. Um, we think that poverty, I mean, we've consistently said to Scottish Government about asylum poverty. Uh, and we said it to this committee, actually, and very much we welcome that you articulated to the Scottish Government in your report last year. Uh, you know, essentially the kind of the recommendations that we shared around the Scottish social inclusion of refugees. Uh, but the one that we really emphasised was poverty, and we were grateful to the committee to do that. And recently at a Child Poverty Summit, we spoke again with the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice on this. But we haven't seen that we haven't seen that translate at all into at all into Scottish Government policy making. The fact that you know we've got some of the severest forms of poverty affecting uh, children in Scotland who are in the asylum system, uh, and we're not talking about big numbers here, but the impact is is the most severest you could imagine. Now it stems from the UK government's legislation; it's brutal. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was saying in open remarks, like it's like rampantly rampant social insecurity that's meted out to people in the asylum system, including kids. Uh, but we still haven't seen a, a directive or a circular or something that can come from Scottish Government that says to local authorities, please put asylum and refugee child poverty into your annual requirement for your local child poverty action plans that they and health boards have. That needs to change. Look, we just need to get that in because one of the things I didn't say is, you know, they. Asylum is a national issue now, so you know there's about we estimate by Christmas it'll be about 25 local authorities in Scotland will have people in the asylum process. Uh, Glasgow is the one where most children are, but most of them will be in uh, ex hotels, institutional accommodation, the one pound forty a day, etc. Uh, most of them will ultimately get refugee status. And for those who don't have family yet, they will exercise rightly their family reunion rights. And to, all this is foreseeable. This is you know, the world that we're moving into this year and next year is going to be 
uh, more decisions, thankfully, in the asylum system. But that doesn't need to be a drain. It can be an investment. And that's one of the things we want to get across to the committee, is to think about refugee integration as an investment, as one centred on work and people rebuild their lives genuinely in Scotland, not the new Scottish strategy we've had for the last five or ten years, because that's not cutting through into Scottish Government policy making. So that needs to change, but also that it's more ambitious in what it wants to achieve and centres it around work. Uh, so we've not really seen that level of ambition within the Scottish Government thinking. So we, don't, we don't think they're against this, but we're just trying to say to them, and we'd invite the committee to do this as well, is be please more ambitious in relation to uh, addressing what will be unequal impacts on refugee, newly granted refugees and things like homelessness, unless you start to think of them as what they actually are, which is as people who want to shed the refugee label, want to work, have skills, will work, will contribute. Uh, so when you know, we looked at the Scottish Government stuff in the Warm Scot the warm Ukraine uh, report that it recently published, and we could see that it was about £3 million pounds in tax revenues that were going to come from if people got the real living wage for, for people who came from Ukraine. It's the same with asylum. You know, people are all desperate to work. Uh, like anybody else, as, a, as they know better than anybody, it's a way to rebuild their lives. So I suppose it's not, it's about unless that level of ambition and investment-based approach is taken in relation to refugee integration as a policy objective in Scotland, then those unequal impacts will persist, because basically refugees won't be thought about uh, within the policy the, the policy-making process, including structural ones like the budget process. So we, we really want to see that level of ambition. Uh, it's a win-win situation uh, that we're going to have a lot more people that are there to, to, to basically contribute and be part genuinely of, of whatever it is that in Scotland, um, because you know the numbers are increasing in Scotland, but the decision making is also increasing, but the manner in which it's been done by the Home Office is in their own image and interests, okay. and, but we don't need to respond to it in that way, we can respond to it in a, in a much more substantive way, which centres on genuine refugee integration based around work and access to uh, services and people being continuing to be the self-reliant people they have been and had to be. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Graham. And I know that the, the committee is going to do a small inquiry into asylum seekers and refugees as part of our work programme. So I'm um, keen to invite you along back again um, when, once that's underway. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to move on quickly and bring in Katie Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any of the witnesses think there have been any improvements in the transparency of the budget, or do they have any specific suggestions as to how it could be improved? I think there have been limited improvements, um, and they are limited. Uh, they're still almost opaque, you know, even to policy professionals. Um, so, what an ordinary member of the public can make of them, I, I don't know. You know, I, th I think it's very, very difficult to identify. Um, you know, within very large sums, sometimes, you know, what exactly is this being spent on? What, 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 what are we getting out of this sort of thing? Um, and therefore, to, to prioritise. And if you want genuine involvement of service recipients, you know, the ordinary community members of Scotland in, in this process, it has to be made much less opaque. Than, than it currently is. I mean, you know, even identifying this is definitely new spend rather than you know, re-announced spend is, would be a, a, a big step forward. And this is where there definitely been a cut made, and you know that, so that we can see that we can see the moving parts at least. You know, okay, health spending is largely staying the same, but there's been a cut to this part of health spend. And it's been reprioritised over there. Okay, we get that now. Whereas at the moment, as you're looking at it and you're going, well, X billion was spent last year, X billion is being spent this year. I don't know, you know, what is happening. So I, I do think it needs to be made less opaque. But certainly, as I say, we we actually run a people-led policy panel involved in social care uh, policy making with Scottish government officials, local authorities, etc. We need to have. You know, that sort of involvement in the budget, I think, as well. And to do that, yeah, 
you need, you need to make it intelligible to ordinary people. Thank you. Right, I'm now going to invite Jeremy back in. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll maybe start with Gordon because she's had a go at this already. Um, <laughs> and it probably is the impossible question. Is how should the Scottish Government involve the public more in setting the overall priorities for spending? And what scope is there for genuine, meaningful public engagement in that? On the presumption that, as you said, it's very difficult for people to know the different lines on the budget. Um, I think there are, there are, there's a big opportunity actually on the horizon where I think if we grab it, we could, we could change the, the level of engagement in, in not just budget setting, but understanding how the priorities of government translate into a action and activity in, in, in communities. The Scottish Government are planning to legislate uh, you know, in cooperation of, of uh, human rights, uh, you know, the, the, of the remaining treaties. It would be, um, you know, the, we'll only realise that vision if there's, an, if there's an approach to human rights-based budgeting as part of that. And I think we're at the foothills of, of that just now. Uh, I think from the Scottish Government's perspective, been able to have consistency of budget headlines, more detail below, the, below those kind of big, broad uh, areas. Then you can start a process where people sort of say, right, you know, as Bill says, that's where that jigsaw piece goes. I can start to, start to understand that. Um, so it has to be baked into the processes. It can't just be at the time when the budget's published, we get, we, we get a few people in, because then, then it reeks of tokenism. And, a, and, a, and there's no meaningful engagement. Doing it over a period of time, doing it with whether it's participatory panels, whether it's sector sector based, but really having a commitment to saying we're going to we're going to use the resources we have as a nation to uphold people's human human rights in the broadest sense across all, all, all protected characteristics and beyond. That starts to give a framework for how you can involve people in the decisions about where money goes in their community. I, I'm very conscious of time, but I don't know if I can get one line from either Bill or from Graham, but it had to be one line. I, I, I think you know, everything's going to be human right impact assessed after, after the incorporation. Things are already equality impact assessed, but the problem is a lot of the equality impact assessments that take place are carried out by people who have no insight into what the needs of the various you know, characteristic groups are, yeah. and, and therefore they often say, oh, it's not going to have an impact. You need to begin to involve those people. It will impact on in equality impact and human right impact assessments, and that is a long-term policy process rather than, as, as Gordon said, you are one-off, bring them in for the budget, etc. Um, so I, you know, I, I think you need to get much better at involving people, disabled people, single parents, black and minority ethnic people, asylum seekers, etc., in the policies that, that, that are going to impact on their lives. Yeah, yeah and just to say... to come in very quickly. Yeah, sorry, Thank yeah. you. So, yeah, I think, I echo what Gordon and, and Bill said, it's just to ask, I think there needs to be a promise made. It needs to be firstly worked through as a promise, but a promise made to people with lived experience as the current term is getting used, um, to say that we are going to give whatever the promise arrives at, we're going to give more weight to your evidence. Because when we've kind of grappled with the kind of lived experience agenda, you know, we're, I'm not sure about that term, it'd be perfectly honest with you, and it's like, but I think, because I think it's inserting another layer, basically, of complexity, when it's just like, we want to just understand what life's like for people. Uh, and we want to privilege that but not in a charitable way, but in a way that recognises what it is they're sharing, which is insights that people who are asking often the question don't have. Uh, and I suppose it would need to be a clear promise that's given, and it shouldn't be done cheaply. It should be done after a thought-through process so it's sincere, which says this is the way we'll give to this evidence. Um, I think it just needs that clarity so that you can start to work through this. Uh, and that will make it uncomfortable for people in middle class and other cla and, you know, professions and people who have been accustomed. And, we sh and they, frankly, should be comfortable be dealing with that discomfort. Uh, unless there's that, that's one of the things we look at. Unless there's that, then, then it is going to be well-intentioned, but it could fall into tokenism. So I think it needs to be 
by people in positions of power much more sincerely thought through and honest about what they can actually promise and then give that promise. Okay, thanks, Graham. Okay, and lastly, I'm going to bring in James Dornan. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, just quickly, and I'll start with Bill, and uh, if anybody else wants to, to come in on it, what does the Scottish Government need to do in order to take a human rights approach to the 24-25 budget? I, I think I probably already outlined it, James. Um, yeah. I, 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 I do genuinely think that you need to involve those those at the sharp end um, in, in terms of those budget decisions in, in the process. But from way back, you know, way back from even pre-budget scrutiny, um, they need to be involved you know, throughout in policy development as well as, as, as the final decisions. So it, it does take investment, and I, I agree with Graham. You know, it is sometimes uncomfortable for us uh, to hear truth being told back to us about, well, uh, you, you say more money should be put into that. Well, that's more money for your organisation rather than more money that actually directly benefits us. And, and we, we need to hear that sometimes um, and, and realise, you know, yeah, you know, sometimes it needs to go into those directly to people rather than through conduits uh, like ourselves in the third sector. Thanks, Bill. Uh, does Graham or Gordon have any brief comments you'd like to make us? Can say it any better? No, I think that's okay. Very quickly. <laughs> no. Okay. No, thank okay. okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. No. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, James. And so that that's up. That concludes our you know our budget scrutiny panel. And I want to thank all of the witnesses here today for your for your contributions. It's been really interesting. So thank you. And the committee will consider a draft pre-budget report at our next meeting on the 26th of October. So that concludes our public business. We will now move into private to consider the remaining items on the agenda. Thank you very much.